Good evening and welcome. I'm Kelly Richards, CEO of the All Access Group and the host of All Access Radio. I've spent over two decades as a catalyst and trailblazer in the digital music and entertainment arena. As a super connector, I create powerful alliances at the nexus of technology and entertainment, bringing together leading innovators, entrepreneurs, and forward-thinking creative talent. And as a trusted advisor, I work with high achievers as a strategist and coach, ensuring they have the insights, expertise, support, and connections they need to create greater impact and more meaning in their work and in their lives. Tonight's guest on the show is Jamie DeWolf. Jamie is a nationally recognized slam poet, spoken word comedian, a writer, editor, producer, photographer, and filmmaker. As a member of the performance trio, The Suicide Kings, Jamie has toured the country with a diverse array of acts, including Sage Francis, B. Dolan and the Dwarves, and others. He's a National Poetry Slam champion, the Oakland Berkeley Grand Slam champion here in California, a Youth Speaks mentor, a featured performer on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, and the creator of Tourette's Without Regrets, which has become the longest-running freestyle battle and largest slam on the West Coast, and has been awarded the Best of the Bay by the San Francisco Guardian multiple times. Jamie has performed and led writing workshops at over 130 universities, high schools, and juvenile detention centers across the globe, and his work has been featured on 60 Minutes, UPN, and NPR. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Hey, how's it going? So glad to have you. We've been trying to make this happen for a while. Um, yeah, thanks. You know, I, I, I like to start a little bit uh, with some chronology for background. Um, sure. I know you first started performing in your hometowns of Benicia and Vallejo here in the San Francisco Bay Area, gosh, about 15 or more years ago now. I'm curious to learn what attracted you to slam poetry and what your initial experiences were like. Well, a lot of what attracted me was uh, the fact that there was so much freedom in terms of what kind of performance you could do. I think that before I had been doing a lot of theater and film, and what I think was felt limiting about theater was a sense that very often you were you know, performing somebody else's script, and that typically even playwrights you know, very often did not perform in their own shows, and, and finding a school or a local theater to put on an original production just wasn't as, um, uh, you know, common out there especially. And I, I was really interested in trying to, like, find something where I could do performances completely on my own. And Slam, I realized, really was an open forum for stuff that could be both comedic and also really brutal and confessional or really dirty or uh, incredibly angry, political, anthemic. And the diversity of voices that I saw there was was pretty profound, and um, and also there are some of the only shows that initially wouldn't kick me out. <laughs> so, yeah. some of my some of my first, uh, um, you know, because I, I felt that there was kind of this this interesting collide of worlds, um, collision of worlds that you know in typical other like rap shows had a very different angle than a comedy show which you couldn't really do anything dramatic at any sort of a comedic show and slams has had such a wide spectrum as to what was allowed and what was encouraged and so i I just immediately gravitated to it and those types of performers knowing that they could switch the same styles in the same night and uh the very slam scene was was really new and 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 kind of exploding at that that perfectly kind of place time that I got involved in it, which uh, the first one I saw was in 98 and started slamming that year and then got on the 99 Oakland slam team. And that was the year that nearly every Bay Area slam team won almost the entire show, which had, they were all new poets, um, came out of nowhere and ended up, you know, winning all of these slams and then ending up on the final stage in Chicago. And when everybody came back, there was just like a huge wave of enthusiasm to, you know, follow the momentum of, of this kind of new form of expression. Sure, and, and it was a new form at the time, and I, and I realized that from there you branched out to create your own slam, Tourette's Without Regrets, which you still host every Thursday at the right. Central Opera House. 
So yeah, we just just did it. This Jamie, why did you want to create your own show and tell us about what makes it unique? Um, I wanted to make something that was a celebration of all the kind of renegade forms of art that too often are kind of shoved into different margins, and um, really to basically put together a showcase of everything that I love, which just happens to be a whole kind of crazy cross section of stuff. So, I mean, um, a typical Tourette show is a uh, um, slam poets, circus performers, burlesque, fire acts, a freestyle rap battle, um, a dirty haiku bouts, meat tossing, really crazy extreme sort of shock theatrics, freak show performers, aerial performers. And over time, it's just it's really kind of, you know, enveloped everything that I'm really kind of into and, and excited by. Because I think a lot of artists, they sort of, when they put on shows, they very often just put on a show of, of the kind of art that they're doing. And I just have sort of kind of a feverish, like, fanboy excitement for all different kinds of crazy underground art. And yeah. for me, it was sort of a, a no-brainer to sort of to smash them all together. I kind of see you like a conductor or a circus um, ringleader. You know, you're kind of pulling it all together, a curator even, you know? Right, right. I, I, yeah, I think that was something that grew over time, and, and I ended up, you know, it took me a while to even realize that that's what I was doing. <laughs> and and, and that, I think, has made it a little easier now that I've understood that. Um, I think what, when I started it, really nobody in my in my area was doing that. Um, there were no variety shows. I had no models whatsoever. And so over time, I realized that, in a way, what I was doing was a return to kind of vaudevillian roots where you would smash together all these different kinds of high art and low art and sort of guttural humor and high fault and lyricism and, and sort of battles and different showcase performers. And, you know, over time that there, there have only been a few other shows that I would say are even kind of close to Tourette's and they definitely have a circus, circus environment. Because um, circus really celebrates all these different bizarre oddities and different kinds of skill sets, but yeah. they very rarely use other kinds of like underground um, kind of cultural forces like slam or freestyle battles. And to me, I think that that's what always set it apart. Is I've been to many freestyle battles, many slams, many circuses, and none of them would ever think of you know right after the the aerial act that let's have two guys smash the hell out of each other with, like, you know, crazy obscene language, like in a lyrical fight. Um, it's, it's because a lot of people, I think, when they start a certain art form, they just kind of become a purist about it, and that becomes their whole world. And I think that I've always just been attracted into running through a lot of different worlds. And I think in the same way that why I love film is because it, you're able to incorporate all of these different art disciplines and all of these different skill sets. But I think that show-wise, that's kind of ultimately what I do. Variety shows and Tourette's has almost ruined me, though. It's, it's really hard for me to go to regular shows without getting really well, bored I within, bet. like, 15 I, minutes. I, I, I mean, <laughs> um, but, you know, you are a renaissance kind of guy, Jamie, with all the things we talked about in the introduction, the comedian, the slam poet, the writer, the editor, producer, photographer, filmmaker. That's a lot in one person. Um, where do you find <laughs> the energy to, to come up with all these things? And how do you blend those different facets of yourself because I know you don't silo them. Um, I've gotten better over it, but, but for a while I used to feel like a, a damn near schizophrenic. Um, you know, and even through sometimes even the same day, you know, I've gone to a juvenile detention facility and, and you know, done some really heartbreaking, incredible um, transcendent work with, like, you know, kids, and, and it's really, really hard-hitting and bleak and, and uh, difficult. And then, the, you know, the same night and checking in on a film edit that's of something completely different and then going and hosting a burlesque show that night. So I've gotten a lot better in terms of switching hats um, and kind of taking on the different personas. A lot of it is, is that, in a way, it all comes from the same root. It's all expression. It's all, um, you know, different kind of forms of storytelling and, and performance. And uh, I think the main thing is just, like, keeping it straight and not trying to get too overwhelmed, which no, can happen... I I think so, easily. and I think you're modeling so much to the different, especially the youth that you get in front of. Now, as we just talked about, you've performed and taught at over 100 schools and juvenile detention centers. I'm curious what led you to go that direction, and what potential you think performance art has to help young people heal themselves? 
Uh, yeah, wow. Well, um, I got nothing but trouble when I was in school. Um, all the way from third grade on, um, I actually am getting expelled from one school and getting sent to the principal constantly for my writing specifically. Um, they thought a lot of my writing was too dark or, or had too, too twisted of a sense of humor. And, you know, they sent me to school psychologists. And to me, I, I felt that I was just, I, I was just trying to approach assignments with like a, a much more clever edge to it. Um, I was really inspired by, you know, horror writers and science fiction and, and action and comic books. And so I would even bring that into a lot of my essays and different stories of adding. I felt just creatively I was trying to add excitement, you know, and they did not view it that way. And then um, when I got to high school and, I, you know, very tumultuous kind of violent adolescence, that, you know, poetry and theater became my expression, my outlet for that. And um, But I didn't have many models whatsoever. And, and um, it became a huge chip on my shoulder where I became – really confrontational with a lot of writing and and um and so forth and so when i actually ended up being invited to some of the first high schools that i ended up performing at it, it felt like a bizarre ironic you know twist it felt like a joke that uh, they would even ask me to go into a high school considering i got into so much trouble for it growing I up and then it was perfect i think it was perfect well i yeah what i realized is is immediately is after the first um and second high school workshop that i did that what really moved me about it is I realized that I had never had that, that I, I didn't have anybody that I could model it off of. And the way that certain kids were responding to me, I realized that I was becoming that, that though I was, that by being sort of a wild, you know, crazy performance poet artist, that that was inspiring to them. And actually I'm, I'm friends with and, and work with a lot of people that I was still their first writing workshop facilitator. Um, one of the guys is now involved in Tourette's. Like I literally was the first slam poet he ever saw. And he um, started coming to Tourette's and now he's a part of the cast and crew in Tourette's. And I mean, I, I think it's absolutely life changing um, for all of them. And, and I, I think that as long as I live, I, I will always try to be connecting with youth in some way because um, for some of them, it, it becomes their literally their escape route. It becomes their survival mechanism. Well, and, um, and, and again, they, and again, with uh, yeah. cuts in the schools that have happened, especially high school. You know, we don't have right. a lot of art programs, and and I think we both right. know the, the 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 fact that we had we did at least I did have the the ability to have that when I was going through school, and and I think it does help young people heal themselves by having that kind of an outlet to express themselves. What are they going to do with that energy if they don't? And they're just full of energy at that age. Yeah, it's it's also that that um, I mean, there's two there's two modes of it. I mean, one of it is the fact that they're able to just literally express these these much larger versions of themselves than the world is allowing them to be, which is mostly like sit down, shut up, regurgitate a lot of this information we're giving to you. And a lot of kids, you know, people don't really think of it that way and that like what we ask kids to do is we pretty much ask them to enact the same protocol, but very rarely do we actually ask them, like, what do you actually think about this? Why don't you sit down and we're going to sit down and we're going to listen to your your viewpoint on this, you know, completely uncensored. And, and that, that's what a lot of what we do when we when we work with kids is like, you know, I tell them one of our rules is that you're only, well, this is speaks rule too, is that you're only standard as yourself. You know, that like this is not homework. This is literally like, we want you to write something that you want to say in the way that you want to say it. Um, and of course, and, that has to inform know, their self-esteem, among other things. Well, that's the thing is that you have, yeah, you have kids that that it's that they, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of gifted, intelligent kids get really bored of academics. And I mean, I myself, I'm like, I, you know, I make most of my living as a writer and as a, a performer, and it's like I can write essays. I just don't really have much of an interest in it. It's not, it's not an exciting thing. You know, I'd rather write a screenplay than, than sit down and churn out, you know, criticism of another work of art. I'd rather go and make my own art. And, you know, for kids who are in high school, some of these kids that that, that are maybe frustrated writing and regurgitating a lot of the academia, uh, you know, and, and that sort of work, is like they may be some of the most clever and brilliant kids when it comes to, like, if you ask them to write some rhymes, if you ask them to write a play, or or even comedy, you know what I mean, stuff like that. So yeah. Um, 
that's always that, I mean that's been an amazing amazing experience that I wouldn't trade for anything about oh I, mean, I can well imagine that, and now let's contrast that to what you're doing with the prison system you, you hosted the first ever slam poetry competition at San Quentin and that must yeah. have been wild can you describe what the energy was like in that room that was amazing because at first I'm not gonna lie um, you know, you're coming there, you're a little trepidatious, and San Quentin did not exactly make you feel any more calm. Nope. I mean, the first thing they tell you when you're outside, the liter- I mean, they have, like, you know, several guns, a, a pepper spray can the size of a football. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen hanging off his leg. And they tell you literally before you go inside, they're like, so we're required by law to tell you that we have a no-hostage negotiation policy. You're like, well, what does that mean? I said, well, in the case that you're taken hostage, the state will not negotiate for your release. Oh, great. And they're like, and they're like what does that mean? It's like, well, typically that means – what, what's that supposed to mean is that to a convict is that the convict knows that they can take you hostage all you want and that w- the state will not release them for your release. I'm like, well – Okay, and they're like, the idea is so that there's no incentive for a hostage to take you. No, I, I get that, but that sure doesn't inspire confidence to want to walk through the yeah, gate. This is, not a, this is still not a comforting thought. So, so anyway, <laughs> so we go in, and at first they want us to perform on the literal prison yard. They're about to set up a podium and a mic just facing all of the inmates who are, like, playing football, lifting weights, walking around and smoking. And I was like, you know, this isn't – do you guys have, like, a classroom and, like, a performance space? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And I was like, thank God. So we go to the in the classroom space, and, you know, I was a little nervous because, uh, you know, I really didn't want to bomb. <laughs> I was like, no I, kidding. the last place you want to suck is at San Quentin. And uh, and so I picked this, this particular piece that, um, you know, once we started performing it, the fact that we were like landing punchlines and they were like roaring um, and going nuts and it just it felt so amazing because you you know you just you just drop all the like oh these are prisoners some of these are murderers that kind of aspect and realize that they're the same as everybody else you know I mean they still like the, I mean they're into jokes and they're actually um, an incredible even more an incredible audience than most because they're they're really mad appreciative that you're there you know oh, yeah. and they had to earn it. They had to earn themselves um, this stuff with, like, you know, classes of good behavior. And a lot of them are incredible writers. You know, they're, they're incredible. They, they have a much more hard-edged uh, wisdom and sense of humor, you know, than, like, your typical college class, per se. And some of the poems that they wrote in there were just, like, staggering. This guy had this whole amazing piece. Uh, there's two that I'll never forget. That um, One was about a guy. He had a whole love poem to crack cocaine. And it was all about how crack cocaine was the worst ex girlfriend that he ever had. But then oh. she had such a seductive grip on him that it was like, you know, that every time he would get out, that she would call him up and be like, hey, you know, I miss you, baby. And he's like, no, I got to keep you out of my life. You're nothing but trouble. You know, but then he'd go to a party and there she'd be. And before he knows it, he's like making out with his ex. And there he, and then he's, you know, in prison again. And there was another piece that was shortly before Tookie Williams' execution. And there were two. There were two inmates who um, um, I found out were both in there for murder. Um, one of them was was definitively in the past was a gang member. And what was incredible about the piece is they actually wrote a pro con piece about the execution. I mean, I would have to guess that they were probably both against this, you know, him being executed. Um, but the fact that they really they took one of these workshops and then wrote this total flip side like even arguing, um, like personifying the state and the state's perspective on it. And it was incredible. I mean, and what happened is that I, so I hosted the first one, and then after that, the inmates, they actually tag team hosted the next event. Wow. Um, and, I was just, and I was just another performer in it. And, I mean, it was, it was awesome, though. It was packed, you know. And, I mean, you're sitting there with guys with, like, swastikas on their face, you know, and... You know, and, and it's an incredibly diverse room. And but I mean it's like once the slam started, I mean they're going nuts. Like the energy was, was amazing. It was incredible. I right. mean I literally if, if if their program was better I would I would do it once a month. I mean it's like, you know, everybody's there for free. We're bringing in other poets, um, who are all like just really excited to be there. And the fact of it is is that I literally view prisoners and I know a lot of the poets that I bring in and the folks that we go with is like I'm only one 
a rest away from any of those guys. And I've, I've been, I don't view it as that there's any difference between me and any of the guy in there. The only difference is that I didn't get caught. Um, the only difference is that, you know, I chose another door or another thing to go down. But, but trust me, I've, I've gotten away with my fair share of felonies in my life. Um, and so yeah. a lot of these guys, that, that, that's I, I what it is. That. I get that when, from when you described your, uh, your, your earlier experiences. Um, I would like to move on, though, because we do have a few more things sure. I'd love to cover in our time together. Um, sure. And one of those is how you got together, if you wouldn't mind telling the story, with the Suicide Kings. And what it was like mm-hmm. in the nation with such amazing performers. Well, I think uh, I think what was so incredible about that is meeting Rupert. When I met Rupert, Rupert had moved here from the Philippines. Um, he was basically in a gang when he was over there, and then also when he came back over here. And Tourette's was one of the first shows that he started really performing at. And he had such an incredible... Um, just like such like wrenching stories that were so brutal and so fearless, but he was really invested into the lyricism of his writing. And we were out in Vallejo, and you know we both started going to slams together. And, and Jeff um, was out of San Jose, and I think a lot of it was that we just had a different allegiance to sort of a, a much harsher truth, whether it was like just being a, um, much more like fearless uh, in terms of subject matter and, and not trying to be pretty. There'd be a lot of pieces that were kind of um, very heroic and, uh, you know, trying to be inspiring and anthemic. And we really bought it on the fact that we were writing on a lot of really ugly subjects, you know, it was like self-mutilation or friends of ours that had been murdered or crimes that we had committed, um, yeah. you know, like much harsher subject matter than some of the poets that we were we were meeting were writing about. I mean, some of them are writing like, you know, you go to a typical open mic, some people are writing about like beautiful leaves on a tree, you know, or um, <laughs> or world peace, and, and we were coming from a much different direction. And you're, um, and you're bringing more, bombs to a knife fight. Yeah, it was much more of a gutter sensibility, and also the fact that we were really informed by a lot of um, kind of much more of a punk sensibility yeah. And so I think I think that we really connected in terms of that, and that evolved into us writing and performing a lot together, which ended up, you know, resulting in a in a play that was all about school shootings and, and kind of survival through art. And the kind of irony that you have these guys with these three incredibly violent and checkered past, who now are all doing writing workshops in high schools together and and, and trying to work with the same youth that you know inevitably that we that we were and that had evolved into adults who are basically, you know, just a, a nice edge away from, from those same kids. Exactly. Uh, right. Even, even worse futures. And, you know, that sense of, of, of that, that kind of dangerous question that I think a lot of schools um, always wrestle with is like, is, is the fact that I used to be suicidal, violent and, and, and the kid who was potentially dangerous in high school does that mean I should be the one that comes back into the high schools or, or should I be the guy that you should absolutely not have anywhere near your kids? And I would obviously argue for the former because I always felt that that was the problem is that I wasn't meeting people. I felt understood what I was going through. And yeah. when you meet people, when I have like literally like, am I able to talk to a kid and I'm able to show them like scars on my arms and be like, look, I totally get it. And I've absolutely been there. And like the difference is that I'm not going to judge you. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you, why would this possibly happen is I'm going to just try to, sh- you know, I'm not going to ask you why you feel this way or how could you feel this way. It's more of like, I understand what you're going through to a degree and there's more that I, I can try to, but that there's, there's another way out of this. Um, there's it's many so, other ways so out powerful. of this. It's than just what such great work, you. Jamie. It's just, and you coming from that space makes it all the more authentic and really wants to make these folks, these kids bond with you, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, well, the problem, what's tough though, is that is, is when you really, when you really try to get kids to express themselves openly is, I mean, let's be fair. Some, some folks in the school system don't enjoy that at all. You know? No. And I mean, they, they, that, that's where you get into the argument of like, how much do you want folks to really express themselves? What if what they're expressing is ugly? You know, is that is that acceptable to some people? Well, especially not, in the but, wake of school shootings, you got you got people even more concerned about what's acceptable and what's not, and how many controls should be layered in. Exactly. 
So yeah, tell us a bit about what it was like to work with Sage Francis behind the scenes. Oh, Sage is, Sage is hilarious. Um, Sage is uh, – Sage is hilarious. Well, I mean, one is that he, he's incredibly focused. Um, the guy is, is pretty nonstop. And what's really incredible about him, and I, I think that is, you know, is inspiring, is the fact that he's always writing. Um, he writes, he's a guy that writes every day and is filling journals and journals and journals. And, I mean, as long as I've known him, that he's been, he's incredibly prolific. Sorry, my tongue's not working prolific and uh and just the fact that he also just doesn't take him very take himself very seriously right. he does absolutely as, a, as an ambitious and, and hungry artist but he is like just has such a wacky hilarious insane sense of humor and um to me those are the kind of folks i i love it's like that they'll drop some really incendiary confessional um really intense and, and vulnerable writing and then literally the next song be putting on a mullet wig and just rapping like an idiot um, with this, you know, kind of insane persona. B. Dolan is the same way. Um, his tour mate, who I've toured with also as well, he has some incredibly hard-hitting stuff and is, is really fearless and ferocious when it comes to taking on subjects, but is also just the most ridiculous, hilarious human being off stage. Well, and one thing's for that, sure, you sure work with, you, you're sure not bored. You work with the most amazing, interesting people. That's for, that's for darn sure. Well, I mean, that's the thing is I, I, I think that uh, – I think that that's what a lot of Tourette's and, and a lot of my career shows is a certain amount of restlessness and not taking something too seriously. I mean, you know, I just performed one of the hardest and most wrenching pieces I've ever written like four days ago. And then like five days later, I'm like, you know, ripping my pants off and there's meat flying around and clowns jumping around. And, and to me, it's that is is there isn't, the difference between like honesty and comedy and, and, and savagery and, and darkness and, and humor are to me, they're kind of all in the same realm. It's just like three different rings to the same circus. But yeah. They all survive on their own. You know I mean? People just do one thing. Just, it just seems so boring. <laughs> well, so that's a good, that's a good segue to talk about the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is the three man play you were commissioned to write in spite of everything. What, right. what, your message do you think that's trying to express, Jamie? Well, it's fictional conceit was the, was the idea that the three of us, the Suicide Kings, do a writing workshop at a high school. The day before, a student in that workshop um, brings a gun back, kills his class, his teacher, and then himself, and leaves a note implicating us. Um, and the idea is that the play moved through a series of, of interrogations going into different monologues and characters and flashbacks and all these scenes of really pushing that edge of, of, of why do kids kill kids and that journey from being that kind of kid to someone who's trying to work with kids. But in that context, you know, I mean, if we did have, because we've gotten in trouble with school sometimes, we've gotten in trouble for, you know, some of the stuff that kids have written or when a parent would investigate us and, and feel that we were too incendiary to be in a, in a rural care, but that there wasn't enough oversight, you know, things like that. So we wanted to push that issue um, in terms of really going into the dark roots of it. And so we toured that a lot and then um, would also do writing workshops with kids um, before and after wherever we were doing it. And that ultimately led to um, a short film called Ricochet in Reverse, which got picked up by Upworthy just last week. But um, it's, it's basically Congratulations, recreating. Congratulations, Yeah, that's ah, great. Um, yeah, the Upworthy's great. Um, and that, uh, it, it recreates uh, Columbine going backwards before they um, fired a single shot. And just kind of that, that darker, darker question of, you know, instead of being just utterly horrified at their actions, which of course is is totally reprehensible and, and repugnant, but it's to also have more of an understanding of why kids would even do this, which of mm -hmm. course are incredibly complicated. And it, and I'm pretty sure it's not because they like Marilyn Manson, um, no. and I'm pretty sure it's not simply because of video games. It's a far more complicated question than that, and also the question that Americans don't like to ask is why does this continuously happen in America? Right. I think that there's a lot of reasons for it, and there was a lot of different perspectives that I even had for it as well, um, and why I even did it. And some of the uglier ones um, I still think are valid. You know, some of the kids do it because 
they want to be famous and they think this is the only way they're going to be able to do it. They want to like smash their name into history in a very really ugly and nasty way. The sun. They're 15 minutes and you know, I, I was at an amazing gathering of a bunch of bright minds in Sedona, Arizona, maybe two months ago now. And one of the women there happened to be someone whose job it is to go in and deal with the aftermath and support kids after one of these school shootings. And she oh, wow. says there's, there's been well over 150, maybe even 180 of these since, I don't know, the last two years, since, you know, since uh, the one in Connecticut. So right. it's just astounding right. how many there have been. I don't think it was always like this. I think it all pretty much pivoted off of, you know, the, the one in Oklahoma and um, Columbine. Right. Well, and the thing is, too, though, is that is is that the horrific part of it is that literally, I mean, in a way, in, in a way, they're, they're kind of all terrorist acts. They're like suicide bombers in a way. Like yeah. These kind of self-made psychotic campaigns. And that's what's difficult about it is that in a way you don't you don't even want to give them more attention um, because that's what they wanted. The fact that we know who Eric and Dylan are. Um, is in a way what they wanted. I mean, in their videotapes, they were talking about how Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino should direct the film of their massacre. You know what I mean? That they they were very obsessed with that they were going to be known forever. And yeah. But also some of that is this this horrific adolescent mentality, this this angry child mentality of not thinking of any other way to be remembered. And I think that that. I think that I intrinsically understood that very early on um, with all of my agony and all of my anger that I was going through as a, as a violent young man. The difference was is that I, really, I chose um, art, that I chose another way to try to be remembered. So you chose you know, another and, vehicle to express yourself, but I think you'll be the first to admit that probably what's going on there is these kids did not feel acknowledged for who they no, really they were. Invisible. I mean, that, that's what I understand more than anybody is that a lot of these folks are on the verge of psychosis anyways. Um, but, but the fact is for a lot of them that you hear, if, if you had to group all of these school shooters together, right, and what are the commonalities, I, I don't think bullies is the most common uh, trope of no. it. I, I never, well, thought, anything, I never thought that was the case. I mean, yeah, in fact, loners. Eric and Dylan were, were bullies themselves. And a lot of that is the way the media um, feasted on their story and distorted it. Um, it's so far from being what was actually the truth about Eric and Dylan for, you know, cause I've obviously researched this case quite a bit oh, and, yeah. um, in other, ca- in other cases that, um, that I, I think a fair amount of it is that, um, the sense of invisibility, um, the, the, the sense that no one is listening to you and the sense yes, that I guess you that's don't what I have meant a by lack of acknowledgement. Yeah, that you don't have a place to, to say these things. And I, I think that that's also what matters so much um, when when kids get in bands, when kids um, find their scenes and something like that. You hear that a lot. Like there's a lot of people in bands that are like, this band saved my life, you know. Um, you know, when they get into rap or they get into break dancing or they get into – when they get into something that's larger than themselves, um, they have a stronger sense of community. And I think a lot of people forget that is that a lot of these kids are incredibly isolated. Like, just because you have Facebook friends doesn't mean you have friends. Right, 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 them. right. And that's the, that's mean the you have, part. That's the scary yeah, part. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt like I was literally drowning when I was in high school in front of everybody, and no one was, everyone was just waving at me, watching me sink. That's what it felt like. I, I felt like, I, I call it the, um, the invisible boy bleeding for, you know, in front of everybody. You just feel like you're, like, screaming and dying. And there's no oh. one, no one can help you. you I, know? And I mean, there's sorry that you went through that. Um, and yet you've turned lemons into lemonade, you know, but you've been making and directing short films since you were a teenager. And, right. and I think you recently directed and starred in your first feature film in, in yes. 2012 smoked the movie. Yeah. And so you, you've come a long way. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about if you would, if you can describe the particular magic that you look for and try to bring out through your films? Well, I think the fact is that a film is, is larger than you. you know, I mean, um, when you're a performer, anytime I get on stage, I'm still going to be a little pale, pasty, you know, ginger with the big old nose and, and my voice and my mannerisms and, and that's that. And then when you work on a, a film, you can bring in all these other elements and other talents to create something that's larger 
that still has a cohesive aesthetic to it. And I think that that's just incredible. Um, a lot of these films that I've been working on, I've been saying incredible. A lot of these, uh, a lot of this phone call must be in a good mood. Um, that, uh, that uh, I think it's just the bringing in all of these different elements, like for Ricochet to be able to work with a cello player. Yeah, well, I can't play the cello. I'll never be able to play the cello. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the guy mm -hmm. who's dedicated this is, again, his you being life. a creator and a conductor and the guy that's putting it all together. Yeah, but I, I think that yeah, I think that what some people think of is like when they think of a director. Some people, and I've certainly met met other film directors who like this, like. Some of it is like they just really want to be a boss. You know, they really want to be in control. They want to have this bullhorn. They want to argue people around. And, and they're kind of like too seduced by that idea. I mean, to me, a, an, an awesome director is just like the utter exhilaration and, and excitement to be able to like collaborate with such an incredible, uh, incredibly diverse array of talent, you know. Um, and and, mean, and bringing what, out the best in that talent. Isn't that really the job of a director? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's what it's yeah, it's it's encouraging them to just do what they're already good at, um, or, or trying to push to that other, other different extra element, um, you know, the extra edge that's going to bring it out. Um, I, I think that doing Smoked was pretty insane because <laughs> it was just so indie, so guerrilla, um, running amok through Oakland with no permits, and and that we managed to pull it off. Also, the script I wrote for it was not easy at all. Um, in terms of everything was in a different location. There's hundreds of characters in the film, um, and it's this sort of rollick and Mr. Code's wild ride through Oakland. And, uh, you know, it wasn't easy. You know, but from was, everything you've shared about all the different things you've done, it just feels like that falls right into place. That's that's your M.O. That's how you work. <laughs> which is, yeah. you know, which is great. It's it's very consistent with who you are as a, as a performer and as a, as every all the other roles you play. And that right. leads me to your next the next piece I wanted to ask about, which is your work as a producer on an NPR storytelling show, Snap Judgment. And yeah. I want to ask, you know, storytelling is pivotal to everything you do. What do you think makes stories such a powerful medium, and what do you look for in selecting stories for the show? I think, I think it's just the truth that, uh, you know, that everybody has a story, and that we just have to have the curiosity to to find that out. Um, you know, I think when you sit next to someone on the bus is that there, there's something intrinsically fascinating about everybody um, that you meet. And I think that just digging and trying to find that out is what's what's just like stunning. You know, but do you it, think it, that story is what connects us one to the other and individually and culturally and cross boundaries and everything else? Yeah, I, I think it's because that all of our lives are chess matches. You know, that we're walking through each one of our days with a sense of survival, with a sense of mission, and trying to find our purpose. And that and our we tribe identify, members, right? Yeah, that we, that we identify so intrinsically with people against the odds or how they were able to reverse really horrific fortune. And I think that that's what's what, why shows like, uh, I think that's also even why storytelling shows itself are exploding all over. Um, they're exploding in L.A. and New York and, and even out here. Well, my my personal I, favorite has always been the biography, and specifically, for example, VH1's Behind the Music. I, I right. love learning about the backstory behind all of this right. stuff, you know? Right. And I right. think a lot of us well, do. Millions of people uh, are tuning into those kind of things, to your point. Right. I, I think it's because it, that as we feel more connected, we uh, part of us – kind of hunger more for the actual raw, visceral quality of, of being in a room and having someone perform a real-life tale that has some sort of, you know, moral to impart or some sort of shock or surprise or a confession. And I think that this is, this is so much more common, and I think that that's always been the power of stuff like uh, stand-up and, and slam poetry in particular. And also, you know, of, of storytelling is that you are – revealing yourself for your community, um, even if strangers, and you have to have the bravery to get up there and do that. And and that, that being invulnerable in front of a crowd and even hearing someone's entire tale of someone that you're just looking at and that you had no idea otherwise, you know. And, well, uh, and quite think, frankly, that leads to maybe the most powerful and potent part of our conversation, Jamie, which you knew I was leading up to. I, the, As you may recall, I found you by somebody turning me on to this eight-minute clip on YouTube of you exposing 
you know, the fact that you're the great grandson of author and Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard. And right. uh, you openly criticize the Church of Scientology, referring to it as a pyramid scheme. And, yeah. um, you know, I just found that absolutely brilliant, that you would take on an institution of that stature and just debunk the hell out of it from the perspective that only you could. I felt I had to. I mean, it's, it's kind of not even really a choice. Um, I think that what was difficult for me was how can I do this in an artistic way that still stays true to me trying to make good art, good writing, and also doing a service to my own family that has basically just been bludgeoned into silence and bullied into silence in, into a way where none of them will talk about it. Well, and all the way to you having to change your name, your family name. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm... I'm <laughs> I mean, ironically, I'm 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 quite grateful that that was the case. If I was born as Jamie Hubbard, that would that would <laughs> that would definitely weigh on me. It would have been limited. Yeah. yeah. That, that would even it would even be harder because it would just be so obvious that I was related, you know. And, and in another case is that uh, I think that 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 story had uh, you know, I performed about it many many years ago in a short dose, and then the cult came after me right away. And then I went out to Clearwater to sort of battle and face to face and. I, it was really terrifying to see just the monstrous size and scope and how fearless they were in just crushing any and all their opposition. And I kind of went back home realizing intrinsically that, you know, I had a lot more to do in life before just taking on this only, only this thing because they'll basically just, just try to bury you in any way they can. And, you know, but the story had never really left um, in terms of me feeling that I had to, I had to make a statement like for my family and, Snap Georgian actually was the one, you know, who encouraged that. Um, and I, you know, I was in, incredibly, I just had a lot of anxiety and trepidation about about going on record again on it and that, and that kind of scope. But what they reminded me and what was really encouraging is they're like, you know, look, this, this isn't just the story of you attacking an institution or like taking on some cult single-handedly. It's like, ultimately, this is the story of your family. You know, and that they and they once they consulted with some lawyers, <laughs> that yeah. also made me feel better. Of like, look, they, no one can sue you for telling the story of your family. Well, and that more was to what the I point, I think it's um, some kind of incredible closure that you only you have the right to be able to do, because it is your family, and and you are the only person that can weave the threads together and bring it full circle. Of course, from your perspective, you know, there, other people are gonna have another perspective. Well, I think that that's, it, it was owed to everybody in my family that suffered for it, but even more importantly, that everyone that's suffering now. I mean, yeah. because the the fact is, is why my side of the family was so dangerous is it exposed this idol to be made up of rust. You know, I mean, that you could scratch off all of this golden paint, you know, and that he wasn't he wasn't who he said he was, of course, and that there were two men named L. Ron Hubbard and they both went to war with each other over their lives. And that, you know, I mean, he, he was still just a guy, you know, he had a son and then they had a huge falling out like families do. And I felt that there was, I mean, they're a microcosm in itself of what the cold has done to people of absorbing them inside and, and kind of re -traum you know, traumatizing them and kind of scarring L. Ron's master plan into their psychology and then spitting them back out and then trying to destroy them, you know, for the rest of their life if you expose who they are and what, what right. they've done. And, right. um, and so, I mean, I felt I, I felt I owed it. And uh, in a I funny think, way, I, I was like, for, for our you know, listeners, I think L. Ron himself would have known it was a good story. <laughs> well, undoubtedly. Like, but, you know, I, you I know, think what I would a, love to do, I mean, I'd love for you to expand on this as much as you want. You take all the time you want to talk about this as you're comfortable with, Jamie. And I want to oh, point yeah. out, our listeners that yep. there is this wonderful eight minute video of you talking about this in some detail on YouTube. Yeah, it's called it's called the God and the Man if they want to find it. And yeah. uh, I, I think a lot of it is that once I the more I thought about it and the more that this story came about and then I realized that, you know, Elron was a storyteller and, and uh, that's ultimately what he started as and the difference is he went from fiction into a sense of um, you know, trying to make a profit by controlling people and, you know, selling himself, uh, kind of smashing his name into the world and manifesting this kind of monstrous psyche on disciples. And that was a much different path for an artist. Um, but 
I think also I had such a personal connection to him because when I was a kid, he was one of my greatest inspirations as a young artist and a young writer. Um, was a sense of in every bookstore I can find books by him, and and to me he was one of my first models when I was really young, when I was like six years old. I remember being like, oh, you know, Elron, like he was a writer, I can be a writer. Um, and and and, and, as, and was and did you see Dianetics and and the Church of Scientology as one and the same? No, that was um, that was actually completely separated. So from an early age, I knew full well that he was a science fiction writer, and I had his Mission Earth volumes on my bookshelf, and uh, I had a fair amount of his, his work. And I loved science fiction when I was a kid, so to me it was an honor. I was really proud of the fact that I was related to him, um, and I'd always be writing you know, different kinds of stories, um, fiction and fantasy and, and crazy kind of comic book you know, narrative and, and uh so that to me was it was just a model, like the same way that if you were passed down, you know, being a blacksmith or or being, a, you know, like some kind of family trade. I just felt that it was like kind of in my genetics implicitly. But the semblance of a cult and this idea that he created this whole other um, empire that was kept for me for a long time. Um, in fact, I had to find out a lot of that on my own because that was and also people, you know, I'm just born in '77. A lot of that was ongoing um, and was incredibly dangerous to talk about because at that point, the church is getting investigated by a ton of them are going to jail. Um, right. Elrond was running, just running rogue on ships all over the world. Everybody was hunting for him, and uh, he literally ran into hiding. He was, he was completely lost to the world. No one could find him. And um, so at that point, everything was tumultuous, and, and uh, by the time I was born, my grandfather, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., was already at war with his father, and, and there was this ongoing war. So, I mean, this is nothing anybody wanted to talk about, um, you know, especially not not my mom, you know, not my aunts and uncles, because they were, it was ongoing, it was traumatic to their father, um, and so the last thing they wanted is some little, little kid. <laughs> you know well, I, I think they but, also wanted to protect you, very likely. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what it was too. Is that they they didn't want me to know about it because they didn't want me to uh, start talking about it at school. Um, they didn't want people to start asking me about it and to lead me to be vulnerable because growing up they had been hunted equally themselves. You know, they had um, all of the stuff I say in the piece, like them learning how to use a gun and, and stuff like that. I mean, all of that was dead on truth. I mean, my my mom was talking about how her dad, you know, that they would be followed by all these men you know, in different cars and they'd be trying to shake them and switching from car to car and that, right. you know, that he would find these pictures in his mailbox of, of, you know, my mom as a, you know, young kid playing alone on the playground. And, um, you know, there was a day that she remembers that after they were like trying to shake all these people, they got home and he's like, all right, so, um, well, this is the way life is going to be right now. So I'm, I need you to show you how to use this gun, you know, and if oh, people my. come after you, this, this, is, this is how it's going to go. Wow. Um, and so, so yeah, so she didn't she didn't want to have any of that um affect us at all. Well, and, no no wonder, no wonder. They kept it under wraps and um and tried to right. sort of sweep it under the rug so you wouldn't have to be exposed to it. And yet, ironically, here you are doing your best to um honor your family and set the record straight from your perspective and um I think again, you're the only person who really has the right to do that. You and you and they if they chose. Well, I think yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, well, I mean, anybody that's been damaged by him is, is, should absolutely speak out because that that's something that Let they've been using. Let me change the word to you're the best person to do it because oh. of your legacy. Well, yeah. they, um, they have been hiding behind uh, uh, just a really powerful and, and brutal shield of secrecy. Um, that That's what they've been able to get away with a lot of this stuff. I mean, the fact they have, like, slave labor camps and forced abortions and you know, what they've done to their critics and, and, you know, all, all of that has been the people who've been in the cult, they've gotten out, they're screaming to the world. This is what's happening, that this is not just a religion. This is a criminal organization. And they're basically only able to get away with this because, um, they have this battalion of lawyers and private investigators and, and everybody to try to silence anyone who comes out and tries to expose who they were and, and, and what they've done. And I think that what's the difference is now is that the press is finally more open um, to publishing reports on that. They're 
a lot more fearless when it comes to taking them on. But there's still a lot of that that hangs around. A lot of people, you know, won't touch certain stories. They won't go after them because they still They're just threaten to sue yeah. everything. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they, you know, they threaten to sue the BBC, no problem. They'll threaten to sue anybody. They don't care. Um, but the difference is, is that so that 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 climate is changing. You know, they can't hold on to their secrets anymore, and that they're having even a harder time um, trying to recruit new folks because you know the secret is is out. And, and yet, I understand I think, you have a Scientology tattoo. What's that about? <laughs> uh, part of that was uh, um, one of it was just basically that this was a uh, part of my legacy, whether I liked it or not. Yeah, and to me, it's not—it's not even really a Scientology tattoo. It's more of it's—it's um, it's showing that uh, it's balanced with the tattoo I have, the Zodiac serial killer, because um, I'm also a huge true crime fanatic. And part of also what got me into really trying to obsessively learn who Elron really was, was because I was trying to understand when these people turn monstrous. You know, growing up as a, a fervent, you know, fanatical Christian kid myself is when I was, you know, hitting my sort of violent adolescence, I really wanted to understand what was evil because I, I realized I had to stop believing in, in moral absolutes. I don't believe in absolutes, you know, at all. Um, I believe in shades of gray, and I believe that evil is, is one of them, um, that when you just label someone evil – that, you know, a successful soldier who's arguably just killing for a cause, um, you know, I mean, is, is a professional killer. Um, and a lot of serial killers feel like they're killing from a cause. It's, it's obviously a delusional and, and second and just predatory one. Um, but these different kinds of, of mandates that people that, that, you know, what makes people monstrous and that really thin line of, you know, how, how many science fiction writers were contemporaries of Elrond, and he was the only one who's like, I'm going to create my own science fiction cosmology, but I'm going to call it a religion and die a billionaire from that because you just see this game into his appetites of just being kind of a power-hungry, you know, maniacal narcissist who's just devouring on people's psyches. Well, and, I, must um, the Zodiac, this, I must you know, admit, I, I, um, this, is, this is incredibly fascinating. I, I myself am like the great-great-niece of... Um, or great 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 of Robert Louis Stevenson, and I've never oh, been happier wow. to be a descendant of someone like that <laughs> by comparison. Right, right. I mean, in, in some way that, especially in my in my late teens and early twenties, is that um, I definitely had, uh, I definitely recognized within myself a capacity for violence, a capacity for evil, and. Yeah that uh, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to understand what that was. And at that time in my life, being on that verge and being on that edge, um, someone who was incredibly volatile. And I think why I got both of those um, tattoos at the time, which I know would be terrifying to most people, but to me it was, it was more of a, a sense of a reminder of, of what that within us is, is this capacity, these hungers, that you know that we can all be killers or gods, and that in a way an artist is is kind of the middle path. Um, because what I hope for is that you know if I die tomorrow and someone finally you know assembled a whole retrospective of a lot of stuff they do, they would see to me over and over trying to wrestle wrestle with these kind of darker impulses, yeah. artistically, but also acknowledging them. Um, you know, Ricochet is acknowledging like the the impulse to to want to kill people when you're a child. You know, um, and and suicide and that sort of kamikaze like mentality. Um, something like uh, uh, you know, smoke is like wrestling with like outlaw sensibility. Like when, when is crime and robbery like when when does it escalate? You know, something that you think is some benevolent, ridiculous, like funny world of of marijuana can actually be incredibly dangerous. Um, you know, safe is another cell that wrestles with like kind of the dark edge of sadomasochism and things like that. And, I've just been really comfortable for a long time walking on that edge of art, of, of you know, pushing that. And I still want to do more um, in that realm and, and to keep kind of pushing that edge. And I feel like someone like Elrond is the differences with him is that he wanted to die with this heroic myth about him. But the truth of who he actually was is far more fascinating. Um, you know, I mean, like, that the man that, he, you know, he's one of the greatest con men of the last century. And that sort of duplicity, that sense of insatiable lust for, 
you know, manipulation, you know, also mixed with your own kind of kind of psychotic ego and, and, and mania, all that mixed. I mean, it's like he he could have just tired and, and just, you know, tired being a cult and just started writing more sci-fi. And ultimately, he sort of did. You know, he wrote Battlefield Earth. He wrote Mission Earth. Um, but he couldn't give up that, that, like, desperate need for utter control, um, you know, and this kind of fanaticism and, and dying a hero. And, and to me, it's like I've been a lot more comfortable with accepting and and, and lampooning and, and putting the ugly parts of me in a spotlight um, right. and being okay with that. And, I mean, I certainly paid a price for that. Um, you know, some people would much rather have a safer art or, you know, there's a lot of artists that a lot of their art is trying to, to portray themselves as much better people than they actually are. Um, but, you know, well, people, poets who manifest themselves as revolutionaries or, you know, people that, that manifest themselves as models of, of good behavior. And and uh, I, I don't. I definitely don't. <laughs> well, I tell so, you what, this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation, Jamie. And oh, we've thank you. Hours, and I hope we will get a chance to meet sometime because we are both in the Bay Area. But I want to thank you for carving out the time to join us tonight, and uh, sure. And I and I want to thank our listeners as I do every week as well because they're who make the show great. We'll hear you yeah. all again next week on the next edition of All Access Radio. And thanks again, Jamie. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye.